As part of the CCC, um, we have all kinds of various activities. And one I will mention in the introduction, and the second one will be uh, talked about at the end of the session. Um, we uh, created a report for NIDRD um, regarding to what um, the academic world sees as the um, 10 to 15 year um, roadmap for research that is uh, privacy oriented. And uh, the report included many things, including all the talks that had uh, topics that were mentioned in the previous session and all the topics that will be mentioned in this session. And uh, this uh, report uh, fueled a recommendation the NIDRD gave to the government. And I was just talking to Thomas, who was doing it, and he said that it was uh, very useful and helpful. So I'm glad that our work was uh, um, instrumental in pushing these things forward. Um, so we have three talks. This session is mostly about um, privacy enabled by cryptography. So it's going to be um, uh, possibly a little bit more technical, but also a, a different line of work. Um, these are three things are going to be talked about, and it's things in various varying levels of um, feasibility at this uh, point in time, but it'll give you sort of a spectrum of what can be done. And then the last talk is going to be by Deidre Mulligan, who also, in uh, CCC activities, organized um, four workshops that related to privacy. And you'll hear a fascinating walk through um, what had occurred in those workshops. So um, the first speaker is um, Jonathan Katz. Um, I had originally told each speaker that he could speak for 25 minutes, but I'm going to shorten it a little bit because I saw that people were interested in asking questions. So we'll also do a 10-minute uh, question session afterwards. So Jonathan Katz is a professor of uh, computer science at Maryland, and he's the director of the Maryland Cybersecurity Center. He's a leading researcher in, our, in uh, the crypto world, and I would say one of the most prolific writers. It's really amazing, uh, the amount of stellar work that he can produce. Um, jealousy creating. Uh, he <laughs> serves on the steering committee of the IEEE um, Cybersecurity Initiative and State of Maryland Cybersecurity Council. So I'm going to talk today about better privacy and security via secure computation. And the, right, so the premise of my talk is that security and privacy as a whole uh, would be much easier uh, if there were somebody, some trusted entity, that we would all uh, have the faith to, uh, to, to, to hold our data and use it properly. It's actually, well, it's actually interesting. So by the way, I had to search long and hard to find a picture representative of something that, that uh, people might trust. Uh, if you look at the polls, the Supreme Court is the most trusted. Uh, but you know, take that for what you will. Uh, and what I want to do is just actually walk through a couple of scenarios for um, what this might enable, if there were indeed this party or this entity uh, that we would trust with our data. And, and really just uh, you know, not be comprehensive, but just uh, throw some ideas out for people to think about in the back of their minds. So the first is uh, the potential for better data mining, uh, having access to more data while also being able to respect users' privacy. And uh, just as an example of how this might work, so I've represented the trusted entity here by, by a courthouse. Uh, and you can imagine, right, you have this data coming from, uh, from researchers, from doctors, from hospitals, from uh, potentially from patients themselves. Uh, the data could all be amassed in one place, right, by the trusted entity. You could then have that trusted entity perform whatever computations were agreed upon uh, by the public as a whole, uh, data mining algorithms to look for indicators of disease, for example. Uh, they could then return those results to the public, to the individual researchers, to do with uh, what they would. Uh, similarly, you can imagine collecting uh, financial data, uh, pulling together data perhaps from personal loan applications, from banks, from other financial institutions, uh, collecting it again in one place, using that data to make better uh, judgments about the uh, quality of the economy as a whole, and then using that, of course, to make uh, uh, better decisions about what direction uh, things should go in the future. Uh, this idea actually was suggested, uh, or was fleshed out perhaps a little more, uh, in a paper that uh, I worked on with myself and Adam Smith in conjunction with 
uh, researchers at the Office of Financial Research in the Department of the Treasury. You can take a look at that report if you're interested. Uh, it also, this idea of, of collecting data and having a trusted entity that we can um, uh, rely on to hold our data could also be used for controlled information sharing. So let me give some examples here. Uh, so one such example is you can imagine two countries that uh, perhaps otherwise don't trust each other, but both have satellites and are concerned about the possibility of two satellites colliding. Now for this, uh, for, to make a determination about whether there's a possibility or a high likelihood of these two satellites colliding, you need to have pretty accurate information about, about the locations and traje trajectories of these satellites. Uh, but neither country may be willing to give up to the other country full information about uh, exactly where their satellites are. And so again, you could imagine having some trusted entity uh, to which both parties would send their information. That entity could then itself make a determination about whether or not uh, a, a collision was likely, and if so, what to do in order to mitigate that possibility. And this idea also has been suggested and analyzed in a report put out by the RAND Corporation uh, done at the request of the, uh, of the Air Force. Uh, you can also imagine other scenarios uh, involving law enforcement, right? So here we have potentially uh, airlines with uh, passenger manifest data uh, uh, contributing or, or donating, giving their data to this trusted entity about which passengers are flying at any given, uh, on any given date, uh, with other data feeding in about both uh, potentially domestic uh, and international terrorists, and then uh, running some analytics over that data to see whether any of the passengers on a flight uh, were indeed a security risk and alerting the uh, airline uh, if that were the case. Uh, without, of course, revealing uh, any information about uh, any potentially classified information to the airlines themselves, while also protecting the privacy of all the other passengers on these flights um, uh, and not revealing w uh, whether or not they're flying on any given day to any federal agencies unless they are indeed a suspect. And it also uh, opens up the potential for better privacy and security for everyone in, in a more um, uh, a global sense. So we can have, for example, and here I'll, I'll disagree a little bit perhaps with what Dan Ford said. So this is just suggestive of, of something uh, uh, that you might use if you wanted to have a, a key escrow situation where uh, perhaps you get some number of entities here. I'm just illustrating it with two entities uh, that would both potentially have to agree in order to provide access to the encrypted data on somebody's phone. So the idea might be that you can take a key, you can split it into two pieces such that neither piece on its own is sufficient to recover the data, uh, but then a trusted entity, uh, upon getting the agreement and, and uh, consent of some number of these other uh, agencies, would be able to recover the data only, only in those particular cases. Um, similarly, this came up earlier, um, the idea of, of, uh, of, of, of tracking users' behavior and using that to serve them ads. Well, we could imagine here as well that a user might not be willing to share the entire information about their browsing history, but they might be willing to deposit that uh, with some trusted entity. Uh, Google could, could then uh, provide their slew of ads for the day to that trusted entity, and that entity could decide which ads to serve to that customer uh, without revealing any of that user's data directly to Google. Um, more generally, maybe following along the lines of uh, what Butler Lamson spoke about, right? you could imagine taking what he said and, and implementing that in a distributed fashion, where any individual user uh, might take some of their private data, like the social security number as indicated here, uh, and split it among any number of servers, and in, in, as indicated in this diagram, even different operating systems, right? If you're concerned about one particular operating system being hacked, uh, you can uh, uh, diversify, as it were, your protection by splitting your secrets among uh, multiple different uh, locations, multiple different operating systems, multiple different computers uh, administered by different domains. And when you need to use that information to, to uh, perform some computation, collect it all at the central trusted entity, uh, operate on it as, as, as uh, as you dictate uh, without running the risk or, or at, least, uh, at least mitigating the risk of uh, one of your computers being hacked and thereby uh, compromising everything. So as I said, it would be really nice uh, if there were some entity that uh, we could all trust with our data. Uh, when I put up the Supreme Court, I actually wasn't expecting laughter, but that's okay, it uh, motivates the next <laughs> slide. Um, so, you know, unfortunately there isn't, right? And it's worth actually uh, going through some of the reasons and thinking about why that's the case. Actually, I, you know, it's interesting I, I, to hear the talks before me. It gives me the advantage of going afterward. I can, I can build on what they said. And I was amazed to find out that even Facebook is not trusted uh, anymore. I mean, when Facebook can't be trusted, uh, you know, what do we have left? So, uh, you know, there are several reasons actually why there isn't a trusted entity like this, right? So, so one reason might be uh, uh, due to legal or regulatory restrictions. So even if you had, even if the parties involved could potentially agree on, on an entity that they, that they would be willing to trust for some particular application, there may be uh, legal and regulatory restrictions in place that simply prevent them 
from, uh, from doing that or prevent the trusted entity from operating over that data. Um, I think also um, sometimes overlooked is the fact or the question of whether or not this is at all economically viable. So if you wanted to, uh, you know, if you wanted to try to implement the trusted entity by government, I think you already exclude a great number of people. Uh, if you wanted to do it in the private sector, you have to ask the question of whether or not uh, acting as such a trusted entity would be uh, a money-making approach. And um, maybe the jury is still out on that. I think it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it seems to me that it's really not because they're bearing a lot of liability. They, they become a high-profile target. And it's not clear um, the value you could argue, but I think the real question is what people would be willing to pay for that service uh, and how often people would be willing to pay and how often they would be interested in such a proposition. As I just said, it also opens up whatever mechanism you use and wherever you locate this data. And no matter how much you trust that entity, uh, it does then become a central point of attack and a focus of hackers. So you can have the best trust in, in some uh, individual or some uh, corporation to uh, hold on to your data, but then you suddenly open them up to attacks from all over the world who are actually uh, have a high value target now on which to focus their attention. <clears throat> and I think maybe the, the uh, 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 primary reason is just that in many cases you have simply incompatible trust frameworks. If you go back to that uh, picture I had earlier of the US and Russia, um, you know, there's probably no entity that they would jointly agree on uh, to be trusted for that application. So as I said, it would be really nice uh, if there was someone we could all trust with our data. But in fact, even better would be if we could avoid the need for this trust in the first place. And this is exactly what the cryptographic mechanism of secure computation enables. So here we just have a, a, a generalized picture of many different parties interacting with this trusted entity. So the arrows here indicate that these entities are all sharing their data. They're sending their data to this trusted party. And that trusted party can then run some computation over the data and then return the results either to some subset of those parties, to the public, uh, or to all of those parties. And as we said, there are no trusted parties. But what we can do, or what secure computation allows, is exactly to replace that trusted party with an interactive protocol being run among all these participants. And when, when you've done that, then um, uh, each uh, party running this protocol only needs to trust the local copy of the software that they're running. Uh, of course, they have to trust the underlying mathematics of the protocol itself, but they don't need to any more place trust in any central authority that's going to run the computation for them. So all of the uh, applications that I had on the preceding uh, six or seven slides that I had indicated on the slide were being done with the uh, help of a trusted party could in fact equally well be done by running a distributed secure computation protocol among all the entities involved who hold uh, their individual private data. And uh, just you know, at a high level, actually, the definitions of secure computation guarantee exactly this notion, namely that the execution of the secure computation protocol exactly serves as a drop-in replacement or an instantiation of whatever security guarantees this trusted party gives you. So in particular, because the trusted party is guaranteeing confidentiality of all the data it receives, so too the secure computation protocol will be guaranteeing confidentiality of any individual user's private data that they, that they contribute to this distributed protocol. Uh, similarly, the trusted party guarantees integrity of the computation, guarantees that the result is correct, and so this distributed protocol being run by the parties will also give you a correctness guarantee for the output. You even can get an availability guarantee, namely that uh, even in the uh, event that one of the parties in the protocol uh, fails, whether um, uh, benignly or maliciously during the course of the protocol, the remaining parties to the protocol can still finish the computation and recover the result, just like they would be able to do in the, uh, uh, in the world with that trusted party that's running the computation on their behalf. And in fact, it even gives you properties beyond the obvious ones that you might expect. Uh, just one that I like to mention often is uh, input independence. So you also guarantee, just like you do when you have a trusted party available, you guarantee that each party's input is chosen independently of all the other parties' input. So you, you can run, for example, some uh, uh, multi-party auction without having to worry that the input that one party chooses is dependent in, uh, in a specific way on, on any one party's, uh, on some other party's input. <clears throat> now there are a couple of caveats, and I'll just mention them very briefly, and then uh, you slide them under, under the rug from here on in. Uh, this does, th there are in certain cases assumptions about the number of parties that can be corrupted. So there are questions about what fraction of the uh, parties running the protocol might be under the control of an adversary. Uh, there are different uh, assumptions or uh, different settings regarding the um, uh, assumed behavior of the malicious parties. Uh, the most prominent ones are the semi-honest model, 
which assume that everyone is running the software that they're given, but they may then try to learn information, disallowed information from the protocol transcript. But then there's also a, a stronger model, the general malicious model, which allows actually arbitrary behavior uh, on the part of any corrupted entities. Uh, occasionally, depending on the setting, there are cryptographic hardness assumptions involved. Uh, that's actually uh, fundamentally no different than the assumptions we're already used to from uh, public key cryptography. Uh, and occasionally, there, there, this is actually not a really a caveat, it's more of a, just to mention that you can trade off sometimes weaker security guarantees for better efficiency. So for some particular application, you might, you might be satisfied with a slightly weaker guarantee if it will allow you to, do, uh, your, to run your protocol much more efficiently. So the high-level uh, summary of what's possible here is that we've known since the early 80s, actually, that secure computation is possible. And in fact, it's possible in the, in the strongest sense available. So secure computation of any function you like uh, with security against arbitrary uh, behavior of any number of parties is possible. So this means you can run any multi-party protocol, in particular the ones I had sketched on the previous uh, couple of slides. Uh, and even if the adversary, even if an adversary corrupts, say, all but one of them, uh, you still get meaningful guarantees about the security of that remaining honest party. And um, just to walk quickly through a, uh, uh, this is really the only technical slide I have, uh, just to get a sense of how these protocols can work in the two-party setting, which is a bit simpler to analyze, uh, and this is not the only approach, this is just one approach that's been uh, popular of late. Um, this is, you know, so, so typically the way you prove a theorem like I had on the previous slide, showing that any function can be computed, you have to somehow start with a representation of the function and then show how anything in that representation can be computed securely. So uh, typically you'll start with a Boolean circuit for the function that you want to compute. Uh, and then in one particular protocol, what you do is you generate what's called a garbled circuit corresponding to that uh, non-garbled circuit. Uh, and in this case, P1, the first party, is going to be generating that garbled circuit along with some particular set of keys that correspond to its own input. And what this garbled circuit allows is actually that given the keys for uh, a particular value on each of the input wires, you can then compute the, the entire circuit and learn the actual clear text result of the computation. So P1 will encode its input in some number of keys. Uh, it will do the same for P2's input. But of course, since P1 doesn't know P2's input, there has to be some mechanism that allows P2 to learn exactly the keys that correspond to its own inputs. And it can do that using a special protocol called oblivious transfer. Uh, at this point, P2 has the garbled circuit. It has all the keys it needs. It can then evaluate the garbled circuit and learn the result. Now, I mention this to you not because uh, I want you to follow the mathematics of the solution, but to understand that we're going to be computing the function of interest based on a Boolean circuit representation of the function. And this should already perhaps, oh, and I should, yeah, and this gives only semi-honest security, and, and there are more complications needed for uh, malicious security. But again, this fact that we have to rely on a Boolean circuit for the function of interest uh, should maybe raise flags, because in general, uh, um, um, modifying your function to have a Boolean circuit representation is going to cause a, a huge blow up in the size. Right? You can have a 10-line C program that compiles to a million gate um, uh, circuit. And I think for that reason, you know, my impression, my understanding, people in the audience can correct me perhaps, uh, but my, the, my understanding is that the general feeling in the community uh, circa 2000 was that this approach was really very nice theoretical. There were great feasibility results, but they were hopelessly impractical. Um, and uh, it, you know, what's been interesting is to follow the development of the field since the first implementation of secure computation, in this case, secure two-party computation, uh, since 2004. So in 2004, uh, this Fair Play paper that I have indicated on the bottom left-hand side uh, gave the first implementation of Yao's garbled circuit protocol for two-party computation. And what I've displayed here is uh, just a picture of the progress in just one particular function of interest, namely evaluation of AES. AES is a secure block cipher. Uh, and in this particular example, you have one party holding a key, another party holding data to be encrypted, and then they jointly compute the ciphertext that results from encrypting the data under the key. And the uh, time here is on a logarithmic scale. Right, so uh, the units are meaningless here, but the time is on a logarithmic scale. And you can see sort of the dramatic change here in the efficiency of, in the time for computing an AES evaluation in the semi-honest model from 2004 to uh, 2015. And the latest sort of state-of-the-art result is that you can compute uh, a semi-honest evaluation of AES in about half a millisecond. Uh, we can look also at the efficiency in the malicious case. This is, uh, again, evaluation of AES with 40-bit uh, statistical security, which means roughly that uh, if a party wants to cheat, it can only be successful with probability about 2 to the minus 40. 
And again, you see here the dramatic improvement in, uh, in efficiency of the protocol. Again, this is on a logarithmic scale from the first implementation in 2009 to sort of the state-of-the-art results in 2016, uh, which gives an evaluation time of about 65 milliseconds. Uh, and that work is actually not, not published yet. It's sort of ongoing work uh, uh, some students of mine are, mine are doing. Uh, and this, sh again, shows the dramatic uh, improvement in performance. And it's interesting also to put these on a, on a graph together and look at uh, comparisons of the semi-honest efficiency and malicious efficiency. And what you see is that the malicious uh, efficiency today is, in fact, better than the uh, semi-honest efficiency just a few years ago. So things are really improving very rapidly in, in, this, in this field. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that there's already, we're seeing real world interest now in using secure computation uh, for exactly these kind of information uh, sharing scenarios. Uh, the first one that I'm aware of from a commercial sense is uh, Partesia. Uh, this is a three party secure computation uh, protocol which was first used in 2008 to uh, run a Danish uh, sugar beet auction. Uh, and since then they've been trying to uh, transition and run other auctions as well, uh, looking in particular now at uh, wireless spectrum auctions. Uh, ShareMind is another uh, available, uh, another company that's been working in the space. They're also doing three-party computation, uh, looking at uh, applications to statistical analysis of financial data. Uh, and more recently, a couple of other startups I'm aware of, looking at two-party computation of AES for protecting actually um, uh, against server compromise. Uh, in all of these cases, it's interesting to note, are, are in the semi-honest setting actually. Uh, I guess they've determined that that's sufficient for their applications. Uh, there are also a number of programs in the last couple of years that have been funding this type of uh, research. Um, just briefly, because I want to end in about a minute, I'll, I'll just highlight some, some research questions here. So I think there, there are fundamentally questions of, of two kinds. Uh, the first is a cryptographic sort of question. Uh, I think there are several interesting questions related to the multi-party setting for secure computation. I think much of the work since 2004, actually, on uh, improving the efficiency of these protocols has looked at the two-party setting. And relatively speaking, there's been a lot less work on the multi-party setting, and I think there's still a lot of room there available for improvement. I think also it's interesting in the multi-party setting to start thinking about real-world deployment issues. Uh, just as an example, a lot of protocols in the literature assume a PKI, and uh, you, you know, right now we don't have PKI except in certain scenarios, and you can ask about what you might do to either uh, uh, implement the PKI or what you might do to circumvent the need for a PKI in the first place. Um, another one I'll mention, just skipping down to the bottom, is this whole question about what functions are safe to compute. And I wanted to mention that because I think it fits in very well, actually, with some of the talks earlier today, in particular the uh, talks related to privacy and differential privacy in particular, because what secure computation gives you is a framework for securely computing any function you like, but determining what functions are appropriate to be computed uh, and what perhaps what noise needs to be added to those functions before they're computed uh, relates more to questions of privacy as well as policy. And so they're really uh, two, two orthogonal ideas, but that, that go very well together, and both would be needed in any kind of application of these techniques. I think also there are several interesting non-cryptographic questions. Uh, maybe one of those uh, that people have begun to look at is the question of usability, right? How easy it is to implement protocols for secure computation, and can we get to a point where non-cryptographic experts, experts can actually sit down and develop useful protocols in this framework? Uh, I think the question of formal verification of protocols as well as implementations is also a really interesting one that would again be important to look at uh, before deploying these. And I, I'm, I have a bunch of other questions and I'll, I'll skip through them so they're on the record on the video, but I'll, I'll stop here and let the next presenter uh, go up and you can feel free to ask me questions uh, during the, during the uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Um, the next speaker will be Shia Levy and personally I'm very honored to introduce him because we've been working together since. It's 1997. So um, Shai is a principal RSM at IBM Research. Um, he's one of the world leaders of the current revolution which we're having, which is very exciting and unclear where it's going, but a lot of amazing things are happening that relate, relate to fully homomorphic encryption and obfuscation, which he'll be discussing. And um, he's one of the unique people in our community that is able to do both the theory in an amazing way and also bring it um, to the practice in an amazing way. He's uh, um, the chair of the steering committee of TCC, which is the Theory of Cryptography Conference, which is one of our leading conferences in the field. So, Shai. Thank you. 
Uh, so I'll talk about computing with encrypted data in programs, so just as a brief motivation. Uh, we're today in this wonderful cloud world where we have this cloud continuously working on our behalf and we give this cloud all of our pictures and data and otherwise. And whenever we need any kind of thing, we get it pre-packaged back to the cloud and it does all that just from the goodness of the, its heart. Um, except, of course, we know that it's not really that wonderful and there are things that are less than wholesome inside of this cloud, be it this virus or Big Brother or just this weird guy with horns. But uh, whatever it is, the, the question that I want to uh, address is to what extent we can use crypto tools uh, in order to help us in this interaction between us and the cloud. Um, and I'm going to talk about several technologies that are fairly new uh, and have the, it, the potential of having an impact in this area. So wouldn't it be nice if I could, uh, before I send my data to the cloud, I could encrypt it, uh, but I still want the cloud to be able to process it uh, in the way it does, to sort it, to edit it, to find interesting things, stuff in it, etc., and do all of that without having to send it back to me so that I decrypt it every time I need to use it. Um, along the same lines, would it be nice if I could encrypt the queries that I ask to the cloud, um, but I still want the cloud to be able to answer that? Well, it doesn't see the question. The best that I can hope uh, for is it can compute an encrypted answer and send me back, and then I could decrypt. Um, and that technology is called homomorphic encryption. Uh, so we have um, Alice here that has some piece of data and she wants uh, the cloud to process the data even though uh, she doesn't want the cloud to see it. Uh, so she has her data, I'm gonna call it X and a key, and she's gonna encrypt the data and send it to the cloud. Uh, and later on, she wants some function of the data computed by the cloud. So let's call this function F, and she can either send a description of the thing she wants to compute to the cloud in the clear, or maybe that is gonna be encrypted as well. Um, and the special sauce that homomorphic encryption is, has is in addition to the ability to encrypt and decrypt stuff, there is the ability to process. There is an evaluation procedure that gets us input the function to be, to be computed and an encryption of the question and computes an encryption of the answer. Uh, and if we have something like that, uh, then the cloud could send that encrypted answer back to Alice, Alice could decrypt it, get the answer that she wants, and the cloud learns nothing. And of course, this is uh, Alice versus the cloud. Clearly, we want the cloud to do most of the work, so Alice only encrypts the answer, dec uh, encrypts the question, decrypts the answer, and the cloud does everything else. Um, just a brief history of this notion of homomorphic encryption. The possibility that something like that might be possible uh, was noted in the early days of uh, public key encryption uh, by Rives, Adelman, and Detosus. Um, and over the years, we had many examples of public key encryption schemes where there are some functions of the data that you can compute. Uh, typically, very, very limited. So, for example, if you have an encryption of two numbers, you can get, uh, there is a tra transformation applied to the ciphertext that would get you an encryption of the sum of these two numbers or linear functions more generally. Uh, the first uh, plausible uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption um, was put out by, by Craig Gentry uh, 30 years later, uh, and fully here refers to the fact that at least in principle, uh, it's possible to compute any function that you want. Uh, and we've seen rapid advances uh, since then, both in terms of understanding the security properties and in, ter in terms of much better efficiency. Um, here is my one technical slide. Uh, we all have intuition of why that should not be possible. And encrypted data is encrypted, you should not be able to compute on it. So here's an example uh, from a work we did soon after uh, Craig's uh, original uh, breakthrough. Uh, this is a simple uh, encryption scheme. You encrypt bits, so the things that you encrypt are zeros and ones. Uh, the secret key here is an odd integer p, and at the top of the slide you see this integer p with all of its multiples. Um, and the way you encrypt is ciphertext are other integers that are close to a multiple of p, so a ciphertext is of the form p times q 
plus a little bit of noise that's called R here, and the little bit means it's a lot smaller than P, and you have to embed the thing that you want to encrypt, this bit of zero and one, and you embed it in the noise. So the parity of the noise, the noise is either even if you want to encrypt a zero, or it's odd if you want to encrypt a one. And if this is your encryption scheme, then once you add and or multiply these integers, then as long as the noise doesn't grow too much, as long as you don't get too far for a multiple of p, then the noise also added and multiplied without any mod modular reduction, in which case the least significant bit of the noise is added and multiplied just the same. So it's plausible that without knowing the secret key, you cannot tell which bit is encrypted. Nonetheless, you can add and multiply these ciphertext and you get an encryption of addition and multiplication of the bits that were encrypted there. Uh, and of course, once you can add and multiply, you can draw a circuit of addition and multiplication in order to implement any function that you may want. Uh, since 2009, we have seen three generations of fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, the example that I just showed was a, uh, an example of the first generation crypto systems. Uh, the characteristics is we have this notion of noise. Uh, the noise grows with the computation, and once it becomes too large, in the example of, uh, before, once it, you get a wraparound mode P, uh, then the signal is lost. Even if you know the secret key, you can no longer decrypt. Uh, the original uh, generation of uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes has a very rapid growth of noise. So the noise grows exponentially with the degree, the algebraic degree of the function that you compute. That means that to compute a complex function, you needed to have lots and lots of rooms for the room for the noise to grow. So your parameters had to be huge. Uh, so this is what makes these uh, scheme very, very inefficient. Uh, two years later um, came about a whole slew of ideas that allowed us to uh, do better. In particular, much better control of the noise. We had techniques that allowed the noise to grow only linearly with the degree of the function, so it's an exponential improvement. Uh, and another technique that allows us to, rather than encrypting a single bit, as I described in the example before, uh, pack many different bits in an array inside of the uh, uh, ciphertext and then apply, when you apply operation, they would apply to the array uh, element-wise. And the third uh, generation, two years later, that gave us even better control of the noise, but uh, it's not completely compatible with some of the optimization so, uh, so that we had before. So right now, we're at a stage where we have two different technologies that don't really sit well together. We can choose to use one or the other. Uh, just in terms of where we were and how uh, far we've got with homomorphic encryption, uh, here is a graph. This is extrapolation of how much work does it do to do a, to, to do a single bit operation on encrypted data. Uh, it started in 2010 with the first attempts to uh, uh, implement a gentry crypto system that failed. They were not able to implement it in a way that would ever run to completion. Uh, the first uh, successful attempt to implement it came a year later where a single bit operation took about half hour to complete. Uh, to where we are, well, that graph ends two years ago, and uh, I guess we, we, we advanced a little bit since then. But right now we're at uh, maybe one-tenth of a millisecond amortized uh, per bit operation. So just, uh, you know, I draw Moore's law on the same graph just to show where we've been if we just waited for hardware to get fast enough. Uh, so it's, it really was an alg algorithmic uh, advance. And the other thing that I want to point out is uh, one-tenth of a millisecond per bit operation is much better than before, but not very fast nonetheless. There's still a long way to go. Uh, a few things about things other than homomorphic encryption. Specifically, I want to mention three technologies, uh, attributes-based encryption, functional encryption, and code obfuscation. Uh, so let's start with limitation of homomorphic encryption. It's an extremely powerful tool, but it has its weaknesses. Uh, one of them is that access to the data is a very all or nothing, like it is in most encryption schemes. You either have the secret key or you don't. If you have the secret key, you can see everything. 
If you don't have the secret key, you see nothing. You can compute to your heart content. At the end of the day, you're gonna have a ciphertext in your hand and you need the secret key to know what, what, what's in it. And if you have the secret key, you could see all of the intermediate results and the inputs. Uh, and also computation is unrestricted. It's fully homomorphic. You can compute anything you want. If I send it to the cloud, the cloud returned to me something, it could have computed anything it wanted on that data. Uh, a different technique that goes back to a uh, precursor by Shamir uh, in the early 80s and was formulated in, in the current way that you see on the slide by uh, Sahai and Waters uh, maybe 10 years ago, uh, it's a different dimension. Here there is no computation, there is just access control and you want an encryption scheme that encompasses access control within itself. There is one public key that's used for encryption many partial secret key, and each secret key associated with some attributes. My secret key would be associated with the attributes uh, IBM employee, uh, black hair and blue shirt maybe today. Uh, and when you encrypt, you encrypt the, um, uh, your, cipher, your uh, data relative to the public key and a policy. Only people with red shirts are allowed to decrypt this data. In which case, when I apply my key to the data, it will not decrypt it, but when Cynthia does, it will. Um, it use, it's useful for controlling access to M. This is an access control baked into the encryption scheme, uh, but there is no computation on the data. You either get the entire data or you get nothing. And what we may want is, uh, you know, this love child of fully homomorphic and attributes-based encryption. And that love child is, uh, the, the technical name for it is functional encryption. You still have one public key and many partial secret key, but now every partial secret key is associated with a function. If, I, if uh, Tal encrypted a piece of data and I have a key associated with function f, I will get, when I apply my key to her encryption, f of x and nothing more. Um, so unlike homomorphic encryption, I will actually get this data in the clear. I will not need any additional thing uh, to get it, I do have my key. It allows me to see, but only a particular aspect of the data. If uh, some corpus of data is, is associated, is encrypted, and I have a key that lets me compute the average, this is the only thing that I will be able to see off that corpus of data, and only for that particular corpus. Uh, another you know, sibling of that is uh, code obfuscation, which allows us to hide secret in software, uh, and I will spend a little bit uh, talking about that. Uh, what I want to encrypt in this case is not data, or at least conceptually not data, but rather programs. I want to have, to take a program P and produce from it an encrypted program P prime that still has the functionality. Uh, well, the font misbehaves a little bit, I see, but never mind. Given the encrypted uh, program, I should still be able to run it on every given input and get the output. But I shouldn't see anything else about the program other than its input-output behavior. Uh, an example, a non-cryptographic example, if I want to patch software, I want to take a program uh, that exists and I want to modify it and get a new program that doesn't have a particular vulnerability, I do not want the patch that I apply to one to, like, to get to the other to reveal what the vulnerability was. So I can use this technology of code obfuscation in order to obfuscate this transformation from a broken to a corrected program in such a way that doesn't reveal the secret of what the vulnerability was. And there are many other examples uh, in the crypto uh, world, there are many examples of things where you could easily do that if you had a code obfuscation. For example, you can convert any secret key encryption to public key encryption in a trivial way if you be able to obfuscate the code. Um, what we have today are sort of, we do have this love child, but it's not fully developed. We have proof of concept construction for code obfuscation, from fu for functional encryption using a tool that I, uh, we use, uh, we call multilinear maps. I didn't talk about what this is, but it's a technical tool. Uh, it's very new, the security of it is still very unclear, and the performance are really, really bad. It's sort of even worse than what uh, homomorphic encryption was uh, six years ago. On the other hand, we have in the last two years really, 
uh, blooming theory of how functional encryption and obfuscation can be used. It turns out that these two concepts that seems very different actually are, are equivalent in many ways. Uh, we have marvelous constructions. We have links of other aspects and, and, and uh, of uh, theoretical computer science. Um, so, and this all is, as I said, very new. I mean, this is two or three years old. Where do we want to go there? Um, I, I mentioned four relatively new, very powerful constructs uh, that we have in cryptography. Uh, they opened the door for many applications. Some of them we were thinking about as science fiction only 10 years ago. Um, for example, think of software agents that can compute and are, would be completely uh, secure against inspection of the host where they run. Uh, fully homomorphic encryption and attributes-based encryption, both of these are already on the road to usability. The thing that we currently have are already useful enough, at least for some niche cases. Uh, functional encryption and obfuscation are still in, in their infancy. We have polynomial time uh, constructions, but the polynomial is large. Uh, and two related, a couple related topics that I didn't have time to mention, I just want to throw them out because these are all relatively new, very relevant to this uh, cloud computing environment. One is verifiable computation. I talked a lot about hiding things from the cloud. I didn't talk much about making sure that the cloud actually does what it said it would do. So this is verifiable computation. Um, here too, there's been great progress over the last 10 years and this too is on the road to being usable. And with that, I'm done. Thank you. And now to our last speaker. So we're going from the very unattainable to the closely attainable. Um, Seni Kamara is going to talk about uh, search on encrypted data. Um, he's currently uh, moving from uh, Microsoft Research to Brown via um, Brazil. Wouldn't we all want to do that? Um, he's, uh, in, he's really interested in using uh, crypto for enhancing privacy. I mean, really trying to bridge the chasm between um, these things. And in 2015, he chaired the workshop on surveillance and technology. Thanks. So I'm going to be talking about uh, searching on encrypted data. So if you've been following the news, uh, you've probably heard of the Ashley Madison uh, data breach. Yeah, you can hear me? All right. Uh, so Ashley Madison is a company that facilitates uh, extramarital affairs. And in 2015, um, they leaked all their data, right? So this was all their customer records, including names and email addresses. So this had uh, consequences, of course, on their business. It also had a lot of consequences on their customers. Uh, you can imagine a lot of divorces, and uh, tragically, there were actually three suicides that were linked um, to this data breach. So another example, which is a little bit more recent, um, VTech is a company that makes uh, toys for children, and there's a hacker that got into their system and was able to recover uh, names and addresses uh, of customers, including uh, the names of some of the children, and including their pictures as well. Right? So this is a visualization of different data breaches just from 2014, and you can see really the numbers are staggering, right? I mean, like eBay lost 145 million records, Target 70 million. Uh, you can also see there's, yeah, so there's the IRS had a data breach, of course, the OPM breach, right? Um, and so the question is, why is this happening, right? And um, the reason it's happening is partly linked to big data, right? Or you can argue that it's partly linked to big data. So, of course, we all know the benefits of big data, right? Industry and government uh, will tell us that it increases or it will improve national security, it will improve machine learning algorithms, natural language processing, location-based services, analytics, et cetera, right? But there's also a downside to big data, right? And in particular, as data gets bigger and bigger, um, we witness different trends. And so one of these trends is that as data gets bigger, it becomes more intrusive and more sensitive, right? Some of the data that we're storing nowadays include photos, medical records, emails, voicemails, et cetera, right? Um, and so this means that as data gets bigger, because it becomes more intrusive and more sensitive, 
um, we have a greater need for security. Another trend is that as data gets bigger, it becomes harder to secure, right? So some of the estimates for the NSA Bluffdale data center say that it's storing about two exabytes of data, right? That's 2,000 petabytes of data. Uh, estimates say that Facebook holds 300 petabytes of photos and videos, right? So you can imagine having to design and operate a system that secures 300 petabytes um, of, of videos against nation states, intelligence agencies, organized crime, et cetera, right? That's a very, very difficult problem. So the natural kind of solution, right, or like the, the sort of the first thing you think about is uh, we'll just use encryption, right? We'll encrypt all this data, and this makes sense, right? Because what is the purpose of encryption? The purpose of encryption is to reduce the attack surface, right? When you're designing a secure system, use encryption so that instead of having to secure 300 petabytes of data, you only have to secure a small 128-bit key, okay? So this makes sense. The problem, of course, is that if we encrypt all our data, right, before we store it, then the data becomes impossible to work with, right? And we lose access to a lot of the operations and functionalities that we take for granted, right? And perhaps the most basic operation uh, that we lose is, is the operation of search, right? And if we lose search, then that means we lose databases and we lose information retrieval, right? Which are both core technologies, uh, just in computer science, um, and, and in industry, right? So this motivates the following question, which I think is a very natural question, which is can we search on encrypted data, right? And I think it's an interesting question, right? It's a sort of, it's a cryptographic question, right? The idea is can we design encryption algorithms that support search, right? That's a question squarely within cryptography. But it turns out that in order to answer this question, we have to sort of import ideas from different parts of computer science. And this includes ideas from data structures, data structures and algorithms, ideas from information retrieval, from databases, from graph theory, and lately, we've even seen ideas from combinatorial optimization and from statistics as well. It's also a lucrative question, okay? So most major companies have some effort going, most of the time in their research divisions, but not always in their research divisions, um, on this topic, including Microsoft, IBM, Google, Yahoo, et cetera. A lot of funding agencies are also, also interested in this, including ARPA, DARPA, and NSF. And of course, there are a ton of startups. These are just some um, that I've written down. There's more, and there's probably a ton that I don't know about as well. Okay, but it's also a question that's important, I think, for society, right? And this is a quote of Edward Snowden when asked, um, how can we balance the benefits of big data with the privacy concerns? Um, he mentioned encrypted search as one of the technologies that could help do this. Okay, so what do these solutions look like? So I'm gonna describe at a high level what they look like. They don't all look this way, but this captures you know, a large percentage. So we have a client here that has some data, and then we have a cloud that's, that's malicious. Okay, so the idea is that the client will generate what I'll call a database. And by this, I don't necessarily mean a relational database. I just mean some kind of search structure, right? Uh, so think of the term database loosely. Um, the client will then encrypt its data and then use one of these encrypted search solutions to encrypt, uh, to encrypt the database. And then it'll send the encrypted database and the encrypted documents to the cloud. And at a later point in time, when this client wants to do a search, it'll generate um, a token, and this, you can sort of roughly think of this token as an encryption of the query that it wants to make. And then the cloud will take the encrypted database and the token, combine them in some way, and then return the encrypted documents that are appropriate, okay, to satisfy uh, the client's query. Okay, so what are the things that we want from these solutions? So we have two types of considerations. One of them are related to efficiency, and the other are related to security, okay? So with respect to efficiency, we care about the size of the encrypted database, we want this to be as small as possible, we care about the size of this token, right? We want that to be as small as possible. There are also interactive schemes where we send multiple messages. So we want the number of rounds, for example, um, to be small. And of course, we also care about the search time at the cloud, right? So we want this to be very efficient. And what I mean by efficient, typically, here we're talking about sublinear time search, right? So the search shouldn't be related to the number of documents, for example, that the client is storing, okay? This is very, very important in practice. Uh, you know, if, if your search takes linear time, it's just unusable, right? So in practice, we really require sublinear time search. Um, so that's very important. So with respect to security, right, um, <clears throat> I should mention that most of the solutions in this space have some, not all of them, but most of them have some form of leakage, okay? So they're not like kind of perfectly secure. They leak a little bit of information. And of course, our goal is to minimize the amount of information that's leaked. So there's two types of leakage. One of them is called storage leakage. This is, this is the information that the cloud can recover by just looking at the encrypted database and the encrypted documents. And then there's query leakage, which is the information that the cloud can recover from just looking at this token, right? Also together with, uh, uh, with this stuff, okay? So those are the two security sort of um, things that we're concerned about. So 
the community has come up with a ton of solutions, a ton of different approaches to solving this problem. You've heard about some of them before, including fully homomorphic encryption, functional encryption, uh, secure multi-party computation, and there are others. Um, so here, I just want to sort of, oh, so I guess, oh, so um, another important point is that, as I mentioned, most of these solutions have some form of leakage, right? And so you can see that there's already kind of a, a trade-off going on, right, between efficiency and security. Um, and there's two trade-offs that we care about, right? So there's efficiency versus security, but there's also efficiency versus functionality. And, and I'll, go over, I'll go over both of those. So with respect to efficiency versus security, this is sort of a visualization of the space currently. This is not scientific, right? Um, this is just to give you kind of some intuition. We have some solutions that are very secure, where there's basically no leakage, right? And you can base these solutions on fully homomorphic encryption, as one example, or on another really am amazing technology, which is called oblivious RAM. Right, or RAM. And these will give you sort of really, really secure solutions, but they're not sort of very efficient, right? Like they're not sort of, um, uh, we still need a lot of work uh, to, to, uh, to make these practical. You, you can also use functional encryption, which I, um, I, I mentioned, and you can get solutions that are a little bit, you know, or that are more efficient, right, uh, but leak a little bit more. And finally, you can use something called property-preserving encryption, which includes deterministic encryption and order-preserving encryption. And you can build solutions based on that. And this will give you solutions that are very efficient, basically as efficient as possible, um, but that leak a lot more information um, than, than, than these other solutions, okay? And so we have sort of another technology, which is called searchable encryption, uh, or more generally structured encryption. And we can also build solutions based on this. And this gives us sort of the optimal level of efficiency, right? Um, but it leaks a lot less in the property preserving encryption solutions, okay? But still a lot more than the ORAM and the FHA based solutions. So right now, kind of this seems to be the best trade off um, that we can get. But of course, ideally, ideally what we want is a solution here, right? Sort of no leakage and perfect efficiency. So a lot of the research that's going on in this space right now is trying to push uh, the structured encryption based solutions in this direction and to push the ORAM based solutions up, okay? So this is for efficiency versus security. The other trade-off is functionality versus efficiency. So here we can, oh, and so as a proxy for functionality, I'll use, um, you know, whether you can handle a NoSQL database, so things like key value stores, right, simple keyword search, information retrieval type queries, or whether you can handle something as complex as SQL, right, which is sort of very, very complicated. So we can use ORAM and FHE-based solutions to get something that handles sort of the full level of complexity, right, something as complex as SQL, but of course at a, at a cost for efficiency. Uh, we can use functional encryption to get something sort of at the complexity level of NoSQL um, more efficiently. And then we can use the structured encryption-based solutions to get something at the level of NoSQL, but even more efficiently, okay? And here, the property-preserving encrypted-based solutions give you kind of, you know, the best, the best trade-off in the sense that you can get um, full complexity, right, the complexity of SQL, but very efficiently, right? But of course, there's this trade-off with security, right, from the previous slide. And so a lot of the work, um, with respect to this trade-off, right, this is sort of the ideal case, is to try and push uh, the ORAM-based solutions, of course, to be more efficient, as I mentioned before, and to push uh, the solutions based on structured encryption uh, to handle more complex things. And we actually just uh, posted a paper this morning online that shows how to push this to be basically here. Uh, not completely, but very, very close. So as I mentioned, right, all these solutions, or most of these solutions have some form of leakage. And leakage is actually something that's very interesting, right? I mean, obviously we want to get rid of it, but from a research point of view, um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions. So we have this amazing theory of cryptography, right, that's been built um, in the 80s, right? I mean, since, since the 80s, and it's a, great success, it's a great success story, right? It's, it's allowed us to reason about confidentiality and integrity and all kinds of um, things that are very, very difficult to think about. But of course, the focus of this theory is really on sort of leakage-free type primitives. And this makes sense, right? Because if you're trying to design an encryption scheme, ideally what you want is that that encryption scheme doesn't leak any information. So the theory you're going to build, right, is going to sort of encapsulate that. But in the, in the case of encrypted search, because we really want efficiency and we, we really want practice, right, we're sort of willing to make some small trade-offs. And this sort of opens up the question of how do we formalize these trade-offs, right? And the theory of cryptography doesn't really give us much, right, it doesn't say much about this problem, right? How can we formalize, you know, the fact that our primitive leaks X but not Y. And we, do, we don't really know how to do this, okay? So in the absence of sort of a developed theory for these types of questions, there's, a, um, there's sort of a, uh, a methodology that's been developed over the years, right? And this includes three steps. 
there's what, I'll, what I call the leakage analysis step, and then the proof step, and then the, crypto, uh, the crypto analytics step. Okay, so in the leakage analysis, you basically take your solution, and you try and guess or reason about what kind of leakage occurs. But you're still not sure if that's true, right? You, it's, it's sort of a best guess. Then what you do is you use sort of some of the theory that we have developed to prove that your solution leaks at most, you know, whatever leakage profile you kind of guessed, right? Most of the time you get that wrong, so you go back, you analyze it again, and eventually you get it right, and your proof goes through, right? So at this point, you know that your solution has a certain leakage profile. Now the problem with this, I mean, so this is already, you know, a step forward, but the problem with this is that this doesn't really tell you what the real world consequences of that leakage is, right? So what we don't know is how to say, well, yeah, this leakage is a problem, or it's not a problem, okay? So, the only way to sort of answer this question, again, in the absence of a theory, is to do cryptanalysis, right? Is we say, well, okay, um, what I'll try to do is I'll look at this leakage profile and I'll try to extract as much information about the database as I can, okay? And so this is kind of a new sort of um, line of work um, that is starting now and, and that's motivated sort of um, by, these, um, by these problems of leakage, okay? Uh, not cryptanalysis, obviously, but sort of cryptanalysis applied uh, to leakage. And this is where the combinatorial optimization and the statistics come in. Okay. So I'll just mention some applications of this technology. So I view sort of encrypted search or searchable encryption as a core technology that can be embedded sort of in larger systems or in, you know, in, in, um, or in other algorithms as well. And so you can use this, for example, to design secure or more private desktop search applications, right? Things like Windows Search or Apple Spotlight, right? Um, all our machines have some index stored there, right? So that we can do quick uh, quick, quick search, but we really, don't, we really don't know what happens to this index, right? We don't know if it's backed up to the cloud. We don't know if somebody just came in and grabbed it. So with this technology, you could actually encrypt this and keep this index encrypted at all times, right? And protect, uh, and protect your information. You could also use it in personal cloud storage services like Dropbox, OneDrive, and iCloud, right? Your data would be encrypted before it's sent out to Dropbox and you could still search over it. You can use it for webmail as well. Your emails are encrypted, um, stored in the cloud, but you can still search over them. So these are just some, some examples, and there's sort of you know startups and big companies uh, looking at how to integrate uh, this technology into these kinds of um, into these kinds of services. For databases, uh, we could also use this, this technology, or ideally, depending on how sort of how much we can push uh, the complexity, uh, for relational databases and for graph databases as well. So for standard databases, this would mean that your database would would always be encrypted, right, even when it's in memory. Uh, which would help for, you know, uh, for data breaches. And for cloud databases, obviously, it just means that, you know, your database would be encrypted even in the cloud. So I also mentioned, so this is a, a small paper I wrote in 2014, and this was really just to prove a point, right? Um, and essentially what the paper does is um, it combines sort of these searchable encryption or these encrypted search techniques uh, with secure multi-party computation, which John talked about. And what it does is it tries to come up with a privacy-preserving version of the NSA metadata program, right? Uh, the, the one with Verizon, at and um, and Sprint, et cetera. So the idea is that the data of customers would always stay encrypted, even though, and the NSA could store this data, or it could be stored in the cloud, but NSA analysts could still do their analysis um, on this data, but without seeing the data. They would only see the results. So you wouldn't compromise everybody's um, metadata. So these are some of the types of things that, uh, that we could do. And it actually would be reasonably, reasonably pl practical. Um, so before I end, I wanted to give you some, some performance numbers of some systems that have been built um, around this technology. So here I'm only mentioning systems that were built, use, um, sort of, or that implemented um, solutions that are provably secured, okay? So solutions that have been analyzed uh, rigorously. So the first system that I'm aware of uh, is a system that we built at Microsoft Research in 2012 called CS2. And at that time, uh, we got it to run on an email collection of 16 megabytes, and we could query it in 53 milliseconds, okay? And so we were like very excited, like this was sort of the first implementation, we thought this was great. Um, and then sort of a few years later, IARPA funded a project um, for searching on encrypted data, and a few really, really nice sort of implementations came out of this. And one of them is Blind Seer, which was a collaboration between Columbia and Bell Labs. And they could, or they were doing Boolean queries, so these are already more complicated than what, what we were doing. And uh, for a query like with two keywords, and so you would do, you know, maybe Washington, Washington DC um, and CCC, uh, they could run that query in 250 milliseconds. Now, th these are outdated numbers, and also this is not quite fair because this is, a, this is an end-to-end 
um, experiment, which includes network traffic, et cetera. Okay, so um, I'm not being completely fair to the Blind Sierra project, but this is the numbers that, uh, that they reported. There was another IARPA project, which was a collaboration by IBM Research, UC Irvine, oh, I should have stated also, and um, Rutgers. And in this paper, this is from 2013, um, they could do a search on a you know, one gigabyte email collection for W1 and W2, so two, uh, two, two, two keywords in five milliseconds. Okay, so this is already like a huge, a huge improvement. And we just finished work on a system uh, that we call Clusion, which on a similar uh, on, on, on a similar data collection, we can do even more complex queries. So W1 or W2 and W3 or W4 in 1.5 milliseconds. Okay. Um, but what you also have to consider is that our system is written in Java, so we're taking a huge, uh, you know, huge efficiency hit from working in Java, right? Because cryptographic operations in Java, or at least in the library that we're using, which is Nancy Castle, are much more expensive than in, um, than in C++. So, oh, also just to mention, we can also do sort of different kinds of things, not just keyword search on encrypted data, we can also work over graphs, right? So we can also sort of um, query encrypted graph databases. And so uh, this was a collaboration that we did when I was at Microsoft Research with Boston University, um, Harvard, and Ben Gurion. And here uh, we could query a graph with 1.6 million nodes and 11 million edges um, in 10 milliseconds. And this is for a, uh, an approximate shortest distance query, right? So this means given these two nodes, I want to know uh, how far apart they are, right? But this is sort of an approximate, um, an approximate version of this. So this gives you some sense of sort of how practical this technology is. So in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've convinced you this is an exciting and ongoing area of research. Uh, I think there's a big potential for impact and practice. Um, there's a lot of new research directions, both in systems um, and in theory. And it's also an area where there's a lot of potential collaborations between different areas of computer science, including algorithms, databases, information retrieval, um, and optimization as well. Okay, so, okay, you're my, are you gonna ask a question? Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> suddenly I thought I might be imposing on you and you're really on your way to the bathroom. Uh, uh, Mark Hill, University of Wisconsin. So uh, I have a question for homomorphic encryption and other things. So I'm an architect and so I calculate uh, 100 milliseconds is at least a factor of 10,000 off of doing the one-bit calculation in clear text. So I guess my question is, for these various techniques, are there theoretical lower bounds on how low the overhead can go? Some lower bounds. Uh, one in particular that I want to point out to is that anything that you do, do as homomorphic encryption or secure computation, anything that doesn't leak any uh, information at all, uh, rules out off the bat things like binary search, things where you make a decision depending on a result of comparison with an encrypted data, for example. So if you want to find an element in an array, you have to work in time that is linear in the size of the array. Uh, this is if you apply homomorphic encryption as the one thing that you do. You can a better use of homomorphic encryption and some of the uh, secure computation techniques that we heard about is as a component inside a bigger system that also draws on uh, things like oblivious RAM so that you can enable oblivious RAM. And in those cases, no, I'm not aware of on any meaningful lower bound. So for a particular technique, yes. In general, if you throw the entire uh, crypto toolbox at it, no, I don't think there is any meaningful lower bound that says that you cannot go faster than something. Follow-up question, Joseph Torellas from Illinois. I assume you've looked at all sorts of accelerators for this sort of thing, right? Yeah. Um, so yes, people have tried to use FPGA to accelerate it. Uh, right now, the work on accelerated homomorphic encryption showed several orders of magnitude of acceleration, but not for the fully functional version of homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption comes with a half a dozen or maybe a dozen different types of parameters. Uh, for some of them, it's easier to accelerate. 
Others, it's possible to accelerate. These operations are mostly embarrassing, par uh, paralyzable. But the thing you're going to have to accelerate is known power of two FFTs on vectors of 64K points. So, you know, it takes a lot of engineering to try to accelerate those. It will happen. Uh, I guess I'm suffering from some kind of cognitive dissonance listening to the different talks. On one hand, we have this amazing progress in cryptography, both on the theory, but also in reducing it to practice. But at the same time, the FBI at the end finds some company, and they don't have to break the cryptography, and they just break in. And so, and this wearing every week, you know, I mean, systems are broken into on you know, a very regular basis. So how do we reconcile this ad fantastic advancing cryptography and the fact that our systems, as I can see, they're getting less and less secure? Yeah, I mean, I think it's sort of the uh, state where things have been for, for the last 15 years, where cryptography is not the weak point of the system. Uh, these cryptographic tools are giving new functionality and enabling new things that we couldn't do before, but it still remains the case that if you have a weak password, somebody can bypass all the cryptography. That hasn't changed. Uh, that, that's just the way things ha have that's been. Not, that's not about, uh, that's saying weak password, you're blaming the users. Okay, but if you so look so now, you have, you have, the problem is not the weak password, that's right? The, the, the system, problem could be buffer overflow. The systems the are insecure, right? The systems yeah. are insecure. So how do we take this, this security you can give to cryptography and we lift it to the level of system rather than the function? So uh, I, I think... Hmm? You mean having programs No, it's about building. How do we get our community, I'm not blaming anyone, how does our community get to building secure systems? Yeah, I, I think actually my take on it is that uh, cryptography has been very successful in, in formally defining and then being able to prove things about the system that you construct and, and, and taking those approaches and extending them to larger systems and beyond the cryptography I think would be great. There's some work you can view it in that direction uh, on, on verifiability of, of programs uh, that's coming from the PL community that I think is, is the right step. I don't know if you would say it came out of the cryptographic community, but just the idea of defining properties you want and then proving that those properties are achieved uh, is something that they're working on as well. And taking that and, and taking it up to the next level to a system, uh, a, a system-wide approach would be fantastic. It's, it's a very hard problem. I mean, so I would say, I think kind of, it's definitely true. And I think the point is that cryptography is a very, very small part of security, right? There's still a ton of problems surrounding it. Um, so I do, if, we, if we could do what Jonathan says, that would be great. Um, but we have to be realistic about, you know, sort of the, the, the impact that cryptography can have, right? It's, it's definitely not a panacea. Just one last thought about it. I mean, uh, before public key cryptography, nobody would imagine that you would send the vast amount, send the vast amounts of data that we send on networks today with any kind of, uh, well, nobody would imagine that anybody would be willing to do that. Today we do that routinely and it usually works. That's the crypto success on that thing. And it's true, systems are broken. Nonetheless, the whole thing still use, mostly works. I, uh, ben Zorn, Microsoft Research. So I, I, I was curious about how, uh, you've seen these great advances in homomorphic encryption, et cetera, um, in terms of the performance. Now, do these uh, protect against side channel attacks? How does the, if, uh, how do side channel attacks work into your, your analysis? <laughs> well, the, the right answer would be it depends, right? But uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't depend, it doesn't. I mean, it has a secret key. If you have side channel, you can extract it. It's always true. Um, obfuscation, you can think of obfuscation technique as something that protects against uh, side channel because even if you're giving me the whole thing, I can still not find the secrets in it. So that, in its full generality, will protect against ch side channels, uh, except that the original phase where you actually do the obfuscation, in which, again, you have a secret uh, state. Um, yeah, that's... Okay, I'll ask the last question. I want to ask a question all the previous times, but there was no time. So um, we're great believers in all these technologies. I mean, we think that they're the best. Um, but definitely we're hitting some barriers in trying to get them implemented and adopted. For example, even the last example of the Verizon and the metadata, of course, it's a, the no... You don't have to think you should do that solution because it provides privacy, but however, nobody is really moving forward with these things. Why do you think this is the case? All of you, I mean, start. Well, 
Well, okay. So in the case of uh, you know the metadata thing, it's it's very complicated, right? Because there's politics involved, there's sort of different interests, etc. So that was just to make a you know kind of a high level a high level point. But uh, more broadly, yeah, there is definitely a difficulty in getting these new cryptographic technologies adopted in practice. I think sort of in my experience working, you know, sort of um, in an industry research lab, what I found is that typically when you're proposing, you know, so as researchers we think that, oh, I have some great new scheme, it's clearly better than the previous approach, therefore it should be implemented. Um, what I found is that that's really naive. And basically what happens is that if your technology is sort of, you know, an improvement over previous technology, that's not really good enough. Your technology has to be much, 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 much better than the previous approach. And only then will people start being interested, right? Because the cost to actually implement your idea and the, the cost of all the changes that will be necessary, right, which we tend to sort of not think about, right, as researchers, is enormous, right? And so if your technology, again, is just a small improvement, it's probably not going to work. You have to enable things that are either completely impossible right now um, or that are just so much better that, that people just can't deny um, you know. But we are offering something completely different than before. We're not offering things that provide privacy. The other algorithms do not, so it is a big jump forward in, in yeah, but, these specific cases. But in many cases, there's also kind of, you know, I mean, there, there are also sort of engineering approaches that can also be used, right? And so you have, as one example, you have SGX, right, which can compete for certain scenarios with things like MPC or, or FHE, et cetera, right? And so for some practical scenarios that people care about, they may just say, well, we don't need all this fancy crypto, we'll just use this. Of course, the fancy crypto will give you additional properties that maybe, you know, SGX won't give you. But these are, you know, these are trade-offs that people are willing to make often, right? Um, I think same thing for identity-based encryption or, or ABE, there are also other approaches that compete. They're not as good, they're not as elegant, maybe. Uh, but they work, and they require a lot less changes to infrastructure. And, you know. Okay, Shire, Jonathan. I mean, I mean, one thing I tried to highlight in my talk is that secure computation now is on the road to deployment. There are some number of startup companies and, and uh, more established companies that are trying to pursue solutions in that area. Um, you know, none of them are successful on the level of Google, but but they do have customers, and they are using their products in certain niche applications. And so from that point of view, uh, it's a su success story. And the question might be why it took so long. Um, you know, why did it take uh, 10 plus years from the first implementation until that point? Um, and the flip side of that, I think, is that there has to be, a, 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 sometimes there has to be also the business case for the crypto. I mean, you can have the best crypto and people might want to use it, but unless you can make money off of it, there often won't be somebody willing to put in the time to deploy it. It's not always the case, and, and maybe we'll see, we'll, we'll reach a point where people push this out on their own, but at least in a lot of times, that's, that's been the barrier. I want to continue on uh, Jonathan's uh, thought. So first of all, I wholeheartedly believe that the, techno the combined technology of secure computation and uh, uh, computing on encrypted data, these kinds of technologies, these are technologies whose time have come to enter the mainstream of computing, uh, just like public key cryptography did in the 90s. Um, I think part of the reason that it took so long is because it does something for which most of us has a clear intuition that it cannot be done. So it's very hard for people to actually imagine business cases for that because it's clear that you cannot do that. Um, I think that as we get these technologies ready for deployment in this niche application and in that particular case, people will get used to thinking that such a thing is possible just like public key crypto, that also is something that clearly cannot be done until you see that it can. Uh, and once people realize that these kinds of things are possible, it would eventually become the best practices for doing this and that and the other thing. And I think we're seeing the beginning of this transformation. I wholeheartedly believe that over the next 10, 15 years, we will see this transformation coming to pass. And you know, speaking of uh, funding agencies, I think this is a good avenue for the government to spend its money. Okay. <laughs> so I hope that we've convinced you a little bit of the magic of crypto and uh, help me thank the great panel. Thank you.